Believe it or not, I had amnesia. It all started a couple of years ago when I woke up at the hospital with no memory of who I was. I remember opening my eyes and having no memory whatsoever. Imagine waking up and not even knowing your own name. But before I go deeper into this juicy story, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell for amazing stories like this one. The doctors told me they had found me on the side of the road with a crack in my skull. A passerby called an ambulance and I was immediately taken into surgery. They said I was lucky to be alive, but that I had amnesia. I didn't know what to think. This was all so surreal. I had brief, fleeting memories of my past, like playing on a swing set or watching a movie at a cinema. I could remember how to speak English, how to count, how to do taxes, but that was it. I had no memories of faces or names or addresses. I wish I knew who I had been, what life I had had. Did I have parents who missed me? For all I knew, I could have a wife and seven children. Were they at this second trying to find me? The doctors told me it was tricky business trying to recall lost memories, especially with amnesia as severe as mine, but they said I could try going to therapy. Over the next couple of weeks, I went to therapy and tried some exercises that were supposed to help me regain my memory. The therapist tried this hypnosis activity to try and find memories buried deep in my mind, but nothing came up. They advised me to listen to some music. Maybe that would trigger some past memory, but nothing happened. They told me to eat a bunch of food and special dishes like fish and chips or beef stew or Caesar salad. Still, nothing they did all sorts of activities to try to trigger my memories coming back, but to no avail. I was starting to get really frustrated. Would I never get my memories back? I read a bunch of stories about people who had amnesia, and it said a lot of them never ended up getting their memories back. I was terrified. What if I remained this lost, confused man all my life? What if I never <laughs> found my family? I was so scared this could become my life. Meanwhile, I had managed to get a low-end job working at a fast food restaurant, but the pay was so bad and I had to work such long hours. The customers were always so rude to me, and they hardly gave any tips. I was lucky enough to get a meal at the end of the day, but it wasn't uncommon for me to go to sleep still hungry, having not enough money to buy dinner. I was really miserable. Throughout this whole process, the doctors and nurses had filed missing person reports to try and see if someone was looking for me. But it was hard, especially since missing person reports could be lost in each state, and they had no clue where I had come from. For a few months, it went on like this. I kept waiting for a phone call to say they had found my family, that they were looking for me, but no phone call came. I continued to work at my boring job and continued going to the therapy sessions that never seemed to work. I started to think that maybe nobody from my past life was actually looking for me. Maybe they were better off without me. Now, I didn't know my name, but I was online one day when this ad came up for this new software. It said you could Google yourself through facial recognition. That way, you can find all images that have your face in it. I couldn't believe my luck. This was the perfect chance. I searched myself up, and sure enough, it pinged with results. I started scrolling through the links, and I clicked on an article, but what I saw made my jaw drop. I found out I was a millionaire. This website said I owned a huge company that sold cars and I had a bunch of properties across the world. I was rich. I also discovered I had a family, a wife, and not seven, but three children. I managed to find my Facebook page and it was so surreal seeing I had this entire life, but I had forgotten all about it. I was currently living in this tiny apartment with mold on the walls and rats running about, but little did I know I was actually a millionaire. I longed to find my family and tell them I was alive. You would think I would have regained my memories by now, but I didn't. The images of my wife and my three kids didn't seem to trigger anything. The memories seemed to stubbornly remain lost. I found my wife's Facebook account and sent her a message. I was using a different Facebook account. I had to make a new one with a new name since I had amnesia, and she read it straight away. I sent her this message. Hi, I think I'm your husband. Has he gone missing recently in the past few months? I have amnesia, so I lost all my memories, but I think you were my wife. I found all our photos together, and that looks like me. Please let me know if you lost your husband. Thanks. She replied with, Get lost, creep. This is not a funny prank. I was mortified. 
She thought I was pranking her. I quickly started a video chat and for a few minutes, I thought she was going to hang up on me. But then she answered the call and she screamed when she saw my face through the screen. I can't believe it, she yelled with tears streaming down her face. I smiled, but I didn't feel as happy as she did. I didn't know her. She was very pretty and seemed very nice, but I didn't have the memories of the man she had married. She agreed to meet up in person and help me get through this. The next day, I hopped on a plane and flew over to meet my wife and three kids. They were all so overwhelmed and were crying tears of joy, but I didn't really know what to feel. I didn't know them. Whoever I had been before, that man was gone for me. I had no memories of them. I could tell they were sad as well. Imagine finding your husband or father after you thought they were lost, but only to find they didn't remember you. But I was persistent in trying to get my memories back. I booked even more therapy sessions to try and help me, and this time I had a purpose. I had to get my memories back if I wanted a family again. Not long after, my wife called my parents and they drove over to meet us. I was living in my wife's house now, but it felt so alien to me. Anyway, I met my parents and the same thing happened. They were so happy to see I was alive, but I didn't really feel excited about seeing them because I didn't remember them. But then what happened next changed everything. My parents told me I had a brother as well and we were sitting in the living room at the time. They said they thought it was best to introduce me to family members one person at a time, so as not to overwhelm me. I was excited to know I had a brother. My parents went to go get him. I hadn't realized he was waiting in the kitchen, but when he stepped into the room, I felt my stomach drop. My eyes glanced to his face, and that's when I realized I was staring at the face of my murderer. All my memories came surging back suddenly, and that's when I realized how I had ended up on the side of the road all those months ago. My brother had tried to murder me for my money. You see, I was a millionaire, but my brother was quite poor. Of course, I gave him money whenever he needed it, but obviously he must have wanted more. He knew I had him in my will, so if I was dead, some of my fortune would go to him. <laughs> it pains me to think of it now but my brother was willing to kill me for my money. I remembered it all so clearly. We had gone on a short vacation together, just as brothers, out to the countryside. My brother suggested we go hiking in the woods and I was happy to go. We spent a few hours trekking deeper and deeper into the forest until we came upon a hillside with a sheer drop. I remember looking over the drop thinking that was pretty dangerous for hikers when I turned around and my brother was right next to me. The look on his face, so emotionless, so deadly, still sends shivers down my spine to this day. He stepped closer and pushed me off the hill. I screamed as I fell and I remember hitting my head against the ground, hard. I blacked out. I guess after that, I must have continued tumbling down the hill before finally landing to a stop by the side of the road. My brother must have assumed I was killed, but I bet he never would have guessed I had amnesia. Back in the living room, I stood up, my face red with rage, and I started to yell at my brother. How could you do this to me? I shouted. My brother looked fearful suddenly, but then he quickly hid the expression. What are you talking about? He was pretending. I was so angry. You are the reason I got amnesia, I said. I heard my parents and wife gasp. What? Asked my wife in confusion. Honey, I turned to her, all memories now flooding back and I remembered my wife. I remembered everything. Do you remember when my brother and I went on that hiking trip? I asked. Yes, she said, still confused. Well, we were on a hillside and all of a sudden, he pushed me. He pushed me over on purpose. And I know exactly why. I turned back to my brother with disgust. You wanted my money. You knew I had you in my will and you just couldn't wait until I died of natural causes, could you? You just had to have my money. What? Is this true? My mom said incredulously. My brother was breathing quickly and he cast a glance at me. You don't deserve to be a millionaire. With those words, he launched right at me and suddenly he had his fingers around my throat. I think he was trying to murder me again. We tussled around for a minute with my parents and wife screaming, trying to pull him off until I finally managed to shove him away and we locked him in the bathroom. 
My wife had called the cops and they arrived soon after and arrested my brother. Seeing my brother had triggered my memories and I now remembered everything. I remembered my wife and children and my parents. I remembered all the time we spent together. I remembered the fun times we had and I remembered growing up. And I now remembered that my name was Nathan. I am Nathan. I looked at my family, excluding my brother, and embraced them with renewed joy. My brother is still in jail. We visit him every now and then, but it's hard. He still resents me, and of course, I can't act normally around him. He tried to murder me, twice. I am hurt by what he did and wish he could have been the brother I longed him to be, but I'm grateful now more than ever for the memories I'm making with my family. And of course, I'm excited by the fact that I'm a millionaire. I went back to my job and I'm still working hard to support my family. We go on vacation a lot and I made sure my parents got a good home. Remember, cherish every moment because you never know when it might end. Hi, my name is Mark and I honestly wish I never Googled my girlfriend. I discovered something terrible and now I can't unsee it. I'd like to share my story with you, maybe as a cautionary tale or perhaps just to get it off my chest. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I'm still kind of grieving our relationship. She was my first girlfriend, and I'm still not fully over her. I've always been kind of lonely. Not exactly a loner, mind you. I did have friends and got along well with guys. When it came to girls, I simply couldn't figure out how I was supposed to talk to them to get them to like me. I was kind of awkward and geeky and super shy, so you can guess that girls never even gave me a second look. That was really heartbreaking, though I didn't admit it out loud. I tried to pretend like I didn't mind at all, but I really did. But before we move on, like this video, hit that subscribe button, and activate the notification bell. This will let you live 20 amazing years longer. Trust me, it works. All through middle and high school, I barely talked to a single girl, even my classmates. I told everyone that I didn't want to date at all because I had to focus on my studies. Now, that wasn't a complete lie, mind you. After all, my parents were super strict and expected me to get straight A's. I studied very hard and was the best student in my class. I also had signed up for all these time-consuming after-school clubs, like math, chess, and robotics. It was really entertaining as well, and my parents were happy about my extracurricular activities. They said they'd look great in my college application. All these activities kept me so busy but I still had time to hang out with my friends from time to time. Not as often as most of them could get together, but still, I did have close friends, but it wasn't enough. When I was in primary school, friends were all I needed. Girls were weird and icky, you know. But as I grew older, I began to realize that everyone was getting dates except me. At first, I really did believe my own lies. I kept repeating the same words whenever someone asked me why I didn't go out on dates. Oh, I'm too busy or I need to keep up my grades. But the truth of the matter was, I couldn't get a girl to notice me if my life depended on it. When I realized how lonely I felt, I began trying to get women to take an interest in me. I mean, all the guys I hung out with had girlfriends. Not only did I feel so left out and inadequate, but when they went out on dates, I had no one to spend any time with. So I began feeling lonelier and lonelier. It was getting so bad and I didn't know how to fix it. Whenever I walked up to a girl at my school, I would just freeze or say something silly. And don't be thinking I was the cute kind of awkward. There's nothing cute about a guy walking up to you and then standing quietly there, opening his mouth like a fish out of water. It was just weird, period. I can understand why girls were super creeped out by me. After a few failed tries to actually talk to my female classmates, the gossiping started. They said all kinds of things about me behind my back. It got kind of nasty. I would see girls looking my way and laughing. I didn't know what they were saying, but I knew it was nothing nice. This didn't help me develop any confidence either, let me tell you. It was a really rough period because people were mocking me almost daily. Girls had all kinds of theories about me, and they called me a freak and a stalker. I've never stalked anyone, but I admit that standing there with my mouth agape doesn't look good. So I understand why they didn't like me doing that. My friends were really supportive. They tried to help me so many times. I can't blame them for not trying, but nothing worked. They tried to help me meet girls, but they weren't interested. 
They even asked their girlfriends to hook me up with one of their friends, but most of them flat out refused. The few that agreed simply couldn't find a single gal who said yes to a blind date with me. Now, I'm not terribly ugly. Sure, I'm not a looker, but the real problem was my shyness and awkwardness. I had one thing going for me, however. I'm loaded. My family is really wealthy, and I get a monthly allowance that is bigger than many people's entire salary. I'm not the kind to boast about it, so most people don't know this fact about me. I do have a brand new car my parents gave me after I got my license, though, and all the tech gadgets a geek's heart could desire. So someone with a keen eye for such details could realize easily that I come from money. Mom and dad are super successful business owners, and if you googled their first and last name, you'd find them listed in Forbes. Since I didn't want a girl to date me just because I was wealthy, I didn't tell people about it. And even if I had wanted to do that, it would be hard without being able to even talk with girls. One day, though, everything changed. I was getting a cup of coffee on my way to school when a girl standing behind me on the line started talking to me. She was so beautiful, I couldn't believe it. I began stuttering miserably, but she was so patient with me. Her name was Michaela, and she laughed at the few silly, awkward jokes I managed to mutter. She was the girl of my dreams, so sweet, so beautiful, so understanding. It seemed like destiny finding her there on my way to school. If I hadn't stopped to get coffee, I would have never seen her beautiful smile. I think I fell in love with her during those first few minutes. I couldn't stop staring at her. Michaela actually had to convince me to head over to school, or I would have been super tardy. She gave me her phone number, though, and asked me to text her soon. You can't imagine how excited I was about it. The second I walked into the classroom, I sat down next to my best friend and told him all about my chance encounter with the most beautiful girl I had ever met. He was happy for me, and we began talking about what I should do next. He helped me write that first text to Michaela, and she answered most straight away. I couldn't believe my luck. Little by little, I began feeling more confident. Honestly, just having a girl notice me and act kindly toward me helped me massively. It was as if suddenly I realized that I could actually talk to one without exploding into a million tiny pieces. I understand that sounds a bit silly, but I really didn't feel it was possible for me to have a normal conversation with a pretty woman without ruining everything. Michaela made it seem so incredibly easy. She never mocked me and was so incredibly patient. This gave me the possibility of finally developing some self-confidence and surprisingly, I discovered I could even talk to other girls without making a fool of myself. That didn't mean I dated anyone else though. I was madly in love with Michaela and wasn't interested in meeting anyone new. I asked her to be my girlfriend, and much to my surprise, she said yes at once. We dated all through the last few months of high school, and everything seemed perfect. I couldn't be happier. My parents allowed me to go out with her as long as it didn't interfere with my studies. I worked super hard to keep up my grades, believe me. I didn't want to give my parents any excuse to tell me I should stop seeing her. Michaela went to another school, but we both graduated in the same year. We went to different colleges in different states. That was kind of a heartbreaking realization for me, but she assured me that we could make it work. She wanted us to have a long distance relationship and I would have agreed to just about anything to avoid breaking up with her. She was my first girlfriend after all and up until that moment, I really thought she was also the love of my life. Michaela was super sweet to me all through that difficult period. I missed her terribly, but she was supportive and that made me feel better. I really felt like she missed me as well. We talked every single night on the phone and told each other about our days. We rarely had any video chats since she claimed that her internet connection was super bad. I was a fool and believed her. Why wouldn't I when she seemed to be the perfect girlfriend? Now, the problem began when I heard someone calling her Alice in the background. It was so odd and I couldn't understand what was going on. I asked her about it and she claimed that it was just the TV. She said she'd lower the volume and that was it, at least for that night. A few days later, the same thing happened. Someone called her Alice and I asked her about it all over again. She again claimed it was just the TV. She watched a show that had a character named that way. I found it really weird and the thing is, this kept happening over and over again. She eventually just told me not to worry about it, that it was nothing. I knew there was more to it and began growing really suspicious. So I decided to call my friends and ask them about it. They also thought it was super weird and recommended I should investigate a bit. 
Honestly, I felt sick to my stomach. I was so worried I'd find something bad about Michaela. She seemed so perfect for me. I typed Alice on Google as well as the city she lived in and a bit more of information I knew about her. Well, I wish I could say that nothing came out of that search. That would be a lie. I stumbled upon a Facebook page and the girl in the pictures looked just like Michaela. No, she didn't look like her. She was Michaela. But her name was completely different. She didn't mention me at all on this account and even had another guy listed as her boyfriend. I kept digging a bit deeper and discovered an Instagram account as well. There were so many pictures there with this other guy. She even claimed that some of the gifts I had gotten Michaela, or rather Alice, were things he bought for her. It was then that I realized that her name wasn't Michaela, and she had been lying to me all this time. She had a double life and apparently had discovered I was loaded. I couldn't believe someone could be so manipulative and cruel. I didn't know what to do next, and I considered my next move carefully. A part of myself wanted to confront her, but I wasn't sure if I was strong enough to handle that discussion. In the end, I decided that I couldn't deal with her lies and she didn't deserve a phone call. I broke up with her with a text message and I might have called her a few nasty names. Well, I'm not too proud of that fact, but I was so angry. She tried calling me so many times, but I never picked up the phone. I have a few long emails from her, but I refuse to even read them. My friends have checked them out and assure me it's all full of BS. Why waste my time with even more lies? So, that's the story about how I got my heart broken by my first girlfriend. I'm still not fully over Michaela, or Alice, or whoever she is, but there's a silver lining to all this mess. At least I've learned how to speak with girls without making a fool of myself. I think that soon I'll try to ask a girl in my class out on a date. Since I'm able to talk to them now, I figure it won't be as hard as it was back when I was an awkward teenager in high school. Truth be told, I want to move on and find true love. It's hard trusting someone after everything my ex did though. Thank you for watching. What's the worst thing an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend put you through? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and check out other videos on the channel. I had an ordinary life with an ordinary family and ordinary goals. But all that changed after I googled my family. I wish I never did it. But let me start from the beginning. The very beginning. I was born on the 2nd of November. I grew up with my parents in a small town with a really small population. I had no siblings, no grandparents, no aunts or uncles, but I didn't care. I had my parents, and that was all that mattered. My parents never really told me about my ancestors. I knew I was a mixed Italian-American, but that was the full extent of my knowledge. Other than that, I had no clue who my grandparents and other relatives were. But I guess it never bothered me growing up. I didn't really think about it. My parents never mentioned them, so I guess I didn't think about them either. But it wasn't until 6th grade, when my other friends at school would talk about going to their grandparents' house on the weekends, and the amount of presents they got on their birthday because of their relatives. I admit, I was jealous. Was I missing out? Why didn't I have any grandparents or relatives? How come my parents never spoke about them? I decided I would ask my parents about them. Why couldn't we be like a normal family? Why couldn't I have loads of relatives to bring me gifts? That night, I walked right up to my parents. Where are my grandparents? I asked. They looked at each other confused. What? said my mom. How come I don't have any grandparents? Everyone else at school does. Oh, began my dad. Well, he seemed to hesitate, but then he continued. They passed away, Franco. I paused. But what about my aunts and uncles? What about my cousins? My mom spoke up. Well, your father and I don't have any brothers or sisters, so that's why you don't have any aunts or uncles. I'm sorry, Franco. I was disappointed, but I believed them. It was a shame I didn't have any more relatives, but it didn't bother me too much. So for several years after that, I ignored it, and I never brought it up with my parents again. Until, that is, when I saw that news article. But more on that later. Something strange about my childhood was the fact that we moved around a lot. And when I say a lot... I mean a lot. We moved around yearly, sometimes even monthly, and I really struggled to make close friends. I just didn't have enough time to form a close enough bond with anyone. My parents always told me we moved around a lot because of their jobs, and I believed them. By the time I was 15, we had moved homes 50 times. 50! 
I didn't realize this was strange until one of my friends asked me where I used to live before, and I told him I lived a lot of places. He asked me how many, and when I said 50, he freaked out. What? He said in disbelief. What's wrong? I asked oblivious. That's crazy, dude. Why? Because you never even have time to live your life. You're too busy moving around. Why do you even have to move that often anyway? It's for my parents' work. What do they do? I paused. Come to think of it, I had no idea what they did for work. Was it something to do with accounting or marketing? But if I was being completely honest, I was just guessing. In truth, I had no clue. And actually, when I thought about it more, my friend was right. It was pretty weird how often we moved. That wasn't normal. And what kind of job did my parents have that forced them to move 50 times? I confronted them about it, but then seemingly out of nowhere, they started yelling at me, telling me to mind my own business. What had I done wrong? All I wanted was to know what their jobs were. Didn't I have the right to know why they had to uproot me from my life and force me to move every few months? Didn't I deserve to know at least? But they told me to go to my room and not bother them again. It was from that point on that I began to get suspicious. What were they hiding? Who did they really work for? Were my grandparents actually dead or was it just a lie? For the next few months, those thoughts and concerns swarmed in my head. My trust for my parents started to waver and I started to question every time we moved from home. It just didn't make any sense. But then, everything changed when I went on to Google. I had a history assignment where I had to research on events surrounding the mafia in the US. I was online when I came across this article on this mob boss or something. He was part of the mafia and he was now in jail for murder and countless other criminal charges. They showed a picture of him and I nearly choked on my cup of coffee. He was the spitting image of my dad. I had to rub my eyes and look at it again. If the date hadn't read over 50 years ago, I would have believed it was my dad. But it looked exactly like him. Did my dad have an older twin? And worst thing was, this man was wanted for murder. Then it struck me. Was he my grandfather? I called my dad and showed him the picture. When he came into the room and glanced at my computer screen, he nearly tripped over from the initial surprise. But he soon covered up his mistake by acting dismissive, but it didn't go past me. I saw his father. I saw the break in his facade. I knew he recognized this man. Was it because it was his father? When I asked him who this was, he told me not to think about it. I was still suspicious though. I decided to research a lot about it. What I found blew my mind. Another article showed this man had a son who had gone missing ever since his father was put into jail. This son had also worked in the mafia and he had been notorious for being the father's legacy. But with him gone, the family business was thrown out of balance. They were searching for this son and to this day, they were still searching for this son. He would be in his 40s now. When they showed a picture from when this son was around my age, I literally felt my mind explode. It was me. It looked exactly like me. But that wasn't possible. I wasn't alive 40 years ago. But then, sudden realization hit me like a punch to the face. It looked like me because this was my father. My father was the son of a mob boss. And that wasn't even the worst part. Apparently, my father had had a really dark past. He was wanted for fraud and scams and murder. My father was a wanted man for murder. Now this was too much for my mind to comprehend. Everything I knew about my parents was thrown out the window. I started to Google my family name, Romano, and a whole bunch of articles showed up about the Romano family and their criminal past, how they were involved in some of the highest criminal schemes in history. I was part of that family. Generations of criminals lay in my bloodline. I was too shocked to search for any more results. This was too much. What does this mean? Was my dad a criminal? Was he wanted? If the cops found out about my dad, would he go to jail? I decided there was only one thing left to do. I had to speak to my parents. And I wouldn't let them dismiss me like they usually did. I wanted the truth. And I wouldn't take anything else for an answer. That night at dinner, I confronted them at the dinner table. I told them all about the mafia and the article I had seen and dad's picture. How he was wanted for murder. My parents were shocked, but then their expressions hardened. They didn't answer me at first. They just looked at each other and a silent agreement seemed to pass through them. 
To this day, it still scares me about the fearless look on their faces. Come on, we'll explain it all to you, said Dad. I blinked again. Wait, what? No, you're right, he said. It's time you knew the truth. They stood up from the table and walked into the hall. I was still surprised by their sudden leniency, but I followed them through. They headed to the attic. Was there something hidden up there? Any clues? Newspapers from Dad's past? What could possibly be up there? They climbed the ladder and disappeared into the darkness. When I followed them, I couldn't see a thing. Where are you? I called out. Then, I heard the attic door slam shut. I jumped, rushing toward its hatch. I could hear my parents below talking quickly. Hey, let me out, I cried. It's for your own good, sweetie, called my mom. I shook the hatch door, trying to rattle it off its hinges, but it didn't budge. My parents had locked me in the attic. I was trapped. I couldn't believe it. How could they do this to me? I couldn't even trust my own parents. This had to mean it was true, right? Why else would they have locked me up in here? I started to worry about the things they may do to me. I knew too much. I could blow their cover. Would they leave me here forever? Would I ever have a normal life again? I banged on the door again. Should I call the police? A whole night passed. I had to sleep in the attic with mice crawling all through the roof. Eventually, in the morning, they came back up to me. They opened the attic door and I didn't hesitate. I flew through, sprinting down the hall. They called at me to come back, but I wouldn't have it. No, Franco, let us explain it to you, called Dad. His voice sounded so sincere. Reluctantly, I turned around. Fine, what is it? He looked at my mom and took a deep breath and explained everything. My father hadn't murdered anyone. He had been framed. A rival gang had pinpointed him for their attack since he had secured a deal that hadn't worked well for them. My dad was innocent. He had been born into that mafia life and he wanted a fresh start. That's when he met my mother. He decided to change his identity. I didn't know what to think. So my father was innocent? He hadn't murdered anyone? I wasn't sure, but then I looked into his eyes and I believed him. I asked them why they had locked me in the attic. Why not just explain all this to me first? They said they needed to get all their stuff ready first. That's when I noticed the packed bags lying in the hallway. So we were moving again. I sighed, but it felt easier once I knew why we were moving. From that point on, we decided to keep my father's past a secret. It was for the best. We always feared what my father's father, the mob boss, my grandfather might do. Would he betray my father? If he got out of jail, would he come searching for him? But so far, nothing has happened. We still remain under fake identities. And of course, I'm not going to tell you our real names. All the names you heard in this video were all fake. Yeah, my name isn't really Franco Romano. So don't bother trying to find us. It was a normal day at school when I had to go to the guidance counselor to talk about applying to colleges. I went in super excited and ready because I had been told that with my grades and accomplishments, all I had to do was pick. My guidance counselor greeted me at the door to her office saying, Hi, sweetie, let's get started. Before this crazy story continues, please take a second to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I began babbling on and on about what I wanted to do in the future, and then she brought my attention to college essays. My shoulders fell and my smile collapsed. Ugh, I really didn't want to write one. She began explaining to me the different topics I could talk about, and I knew what she had in mind without her needing to say it. My adoption. It could really make you stand out, she said. I replied, I know, it's just not something we talk about at home. The interaction reminded me of when I was little and nobody believed I was even related to my siblings. At birthday parties, they would always ask me, where's your mommy? When she was standing right next to me. My adoption was never a secret because it was obvious. I looked completely different from my family. When I got home, I brought it up during dinner. My parents visibly choked on their food. Wasn't that weird? I mean, it's obvious to all of us. Why is it taboo? I didn't want to make them uncomfortable, so I just changed the subject. Now, don't imagine the conversation was ever lively. It wasn't like that at my house. Even as a kid, I was always running around and trying to live to the fullest, while my family was always tame and my siblings preferred to walk. After dinner, I began looking through photo albums. 
The dusty ones at the back of the shelves we never really touch. I saw baby pictures of me and how young my mom and dad looked. I started digging through cabinets and drawers, trying to find my adoption papers or my birth certificate. Every time I thought I was finally pulling out the file I was looking for, it wasn't it. I was looking through my siblings' papers, which my organized parents kept in the same folder, but mine were missing. Wasn't that strange? I thought maybe they had mine separate because I was adopted, but why would they? I nearly turned the house upside down looking for those damn papers. Looking in every corner of the house, nothing. I was absentmindedly scrolling on my laptop. I was stressed because that really could have been a good college essay. When I thought, why not Google myself? Who knows? Maybe I could find something. I typed my name in, honestly not expecting much. But what I saw changed my life. There was a website dedicated to me. Me. I thought, why would someone make a website for me? It had my full name, my birthday, and even the hospital I was born at. It had to be me. There was no way someone exactly like me just happened to be born at the same hospital with the same name. My eyes widened as I read the text. I was dead? How was that possible? I was very much alive, sitting there reading about my death? There were pictures of my family there, my biological family. They all looked like me in one way or another. Some had my same nose and others my exact eye color and shape, but they gave me up for adoption. Why did they think I was dead? My head was spinning. I felt faint. Days passed and I found myself looking at that family all the time. I downloaded the picture of them on my phone and I'd look at it wondering if they're like me in personality too. I almost got caught looking at this seemingly random group of people by my little sister, but I quickly turned my phone off. Even in my dreams, I saw these people. I had a dream that I came home from school, but that when I opened the door, I was in this warm, loud environment full of lively chatter, and that I found my biological family in the kitchen, making dinner together, like I've always wanted to do with my family. When I woke up from that dream, I raced into my parents' bedroom and I found them watching a movie together. Nobody. Why does it say I'm dead on the internet? I asked them. I saw the look they shared and immediately knew I was right to be suspicious. Well, I demanded. I know I sounded spoiled talking to my parents like that, but I was scared and I was right to be. My mom began tearing up, something I had never seen before. My dad started yelling at me for upsetting my mom and told me to get out. I huffed and grabbing my keys ran out of the house. I took the bus for a few stops and then got off at the hospital where I was born. I went to the front desk and asked if they had any information about a baby who was declared dead some years ago. The lady at the desk shook her head and said the information was confidential, which honestly I expected. I then started crying, I mean fully sobbing into my hands. That got her attention and she assumed I was related to a baby that had died. She called over this old nurse and told me to follow her. The old lady was sketchy, to say the least. She looked really grumpy and suspicious of me as she walked to a room down the hall, very far from everything else. When she opened the door, I noticed it was quite a large room. She stood there watching me, but I asked her for privacy and she left. The room was full of filing cabinets. Oh my God, I thought. All of them had years on them and were full to the brim with files each one with a death certificate for a baby. I had a feeling there were just too many to be normal. The most recent file was from the day before. There was an address in there, and although I felt disrespectful, I snapped a picture of it. I also found my own file and took pictures of that, but I felt fine doing that because it was me. I went to the most recent couple's home. I don't know what came over me, but as soon as the door opened and a tired looking woman stood before me, I told her everything. I started ranting about everything I had seen and even tearing up. I told her everything about the file cabinets and she started tearing up too. She called her husband over and they both listened eagerly to what I had to say. When I was done ranting, they invited me into their home and we had a cup of coffee. I thanked them and the man said, you gave us hope that we really will get to see our child. It's the least we can do. They told me everything that had occurred the day before and the only thing that really stood out was the sketchy nurse. They described her to me in detail, shocking detail, because she was so sketchy that they remembered her perfectly well. Her name was on every single document in that room. So I connected the dots and realized she took the babies. The nurse must have sold those babies to other couples. She was stealing them and faking their deaths to get away with it. I couldn't believe how people could be so cruel. And even worse, I was one of those stolen babies. It was getting late, so I said goodbye to the couple and went home. When I arrived, my parents were waiting for me in the living room. 
My siblings were all upstairs, and they wanted to talk to me alone. My dad started asking me to stop talking about that subject because it made my mom uncomfortable. He didn't get a chance to get another word in because I interrupted them asking how they could adopt a stolen baby. My mom broke down crying, and my dad comforted her. You have no idea how hard we tried to have a baby, she cried. She said they felt guilty when she finally did get pregnant and had my siblings. Everything she said felt like a slap in the face. I demanded, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you take me to my family? My mom screamed back, because we love you. But did they really? They always treated me worse than the rest. So did they really love me? I went up to my room and locked myself in. Morning came, but I didn't want to face my parents. I grabbed some cash and stuff I needed, shoved them in a bag, and climbed out of my window. I got lost for a while, but soon enough, I was in a cozy neighborhood, very different from mine. There were loads of people on their gardens and lawns or kids playing on the street. I walked around and felt like I was home. I knew there was a big chance that the family had moved, but my gut told me they were there. I stood in front of a beautiful house. I could hear chatter all the way from the sidewalk in front. When I rang the doorbell, the chatter stopped. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if they weren't here? What if they forgot about me? What if they just don't want me? What if my last thought was cut off by someone opening the door? In front of me stood a girl. She looked exactly like me a few years ago. I could tell she saw it too. Mom, she called out. A woman came to the door wiping her hands on an apron. She had a smile on her face when she approached, but it fell when she saw me. She told the girl to go play with her brothers. I said, hi, my name is Anna. I know this is super weird, but I think I'm your daughter. The woman started tearing up. Out of nowhere, she pulled me into a tight hug. She then started asking me questions like my birthday, where I was born, etc. After I answered her questions, she grabbed my shoulders. Well then, hi, my name is Louisa. She sobbed. I'm your mother. Louisa led me into their home, and it was just as I had hoped it would be. I had two little brothers, one little sister, and one older sister who wasn't there at the time. My interaction with my father, Oscar, was similar to my mother's. We hugged and he asked me a million questions. They invited me in to eat with them, which I gladly did. They didn't stop talking one second. All of them were so excited to have me there, and Louisa was constantly tearing up. That day, I went back to the hospital with my biological parents. We witnessed the police arresting the old nurse for everything she had done to innocent families. I sat down with Louisa and Oscar and we talked for a long time. Everything I learned about them made them better in my eyes than my parents. When I thought of my life with my parents, all I saw was gray. It was quiet and boring and nobody understood me there. But Louisa and Oscar's home was a dream. I decided then and there that I wanted to leave my parents and go live with Louisa and Oscar. I opened the door to my house as quietly as I could and slipped into my room unnoticed. I packed everything I needed into a big duffel bag. But when I looked up, I saw my brother looking at me through the window. He was doing yard work, but paused when he saw me. He ran inside and into my mom, immediately asking a million questions. Where are you going? He asked, to which I responded, none of your business. He then asked, when are you coming back? And when I didn't reply, he started screaming the question at me repeatedly. I finally snapped and yelled, I'm not coming back. He looked shocked. <gasps> And then he ran out of my room. I thought I was good to go, but then my parents came into my room. You're not going anywhere, you ungrateful girl. My dad snapped at me, snatching the bag from my hands. How could you leave us for strangers when we raised you and provided for you all these years? My mom asked me, clearly trying to manipulate me. My parents pushed me down on my bed and started yelling at me to get me to stay. This went on for a long time so long that I was getting desperate. And then Louisa and Oscar burst through the door. My parents jumped them, but Louisa and Oscar were stronger than both of them. Get in the car, go, Oscar said to me while holding back my dad. I locked myself into the car, only opening the doors when I saw Louisa and Oscar running towards me. We were all so shocked at what happened. Louisa and Oscar were having a conversation on whether my parents were dangerous for my siblings in the front of the car. But I was just thinking about how I was going to write the ultimate college essay. When I was homeless, I sort of walked around the city instead of staying in one spot too long. I collected cans and bottles that I could get a little money for, and sometimes I got lucky enough to find something sharp so I could cut my shaggy hair. On the day it all began, I was walking at night to the spot where I usually slept, but there were a couple of teenagers messing around there. They were painting stuff on the wall. 
I knew I looked pretty scary, and they didn't know I was only a few years older than them, so I started running full speed at them and waving my arms like crazy, shouting incoherencies. Before I continue, please remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out on new stories. I laughed when I saw their terrified faces as they ran off, but noticed they left their paint cans behind. It was spray paint. On my wall was terrible graffiti. And I mean terrible, because it looked like a two-year-old had done it. I wasn't really tired that night, so I thought I might as well make use of my new spray paint. I started painting over the terrible graffiti, and realized I was actually not bad at it. It looked much better than the teenager's thing. I painted and painted with only a flickering lamp post illuminating the wall, until I couldn't stop yawning. I shoved the spray cans in my bag and laid down on the least dirty part of the floor to sleep. It became a habit of mine to paint. After a few days, I had covered the entire wall of the alley where I slept in, with paint. It was a huge mural, painted to look like a portal to paradise. I was walking around the day after I finished it when I saw some people taking pictures of it and taking pictures of themselves in front of it. I guess they like it, I thought. This went on for some time, people apparently liking my art. I like making people happy and making our city look better, so I started painting in other places, but anonymously, of course. I filled the city with as many of my murals as I could, and people seemed to love it. Some days I couldn't paint because my cans were empty, but I scavenged for more and kept painting. One night, I found a bunch of perfectly good cans under a great wall. It was even white, which made the colors pop more. I started painting, and when I was about halfway done, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Damn, I thought, the police caught me. I turned around and saw a man. He looked like he was in his 20s like me. He didn't look homeless though, unlike me. Hey, I'm Reggie, he said. I shook his hand and said, I'm Kai. He pointed at the spray cans and said, I see you liked my spray paint. Ah, so they were his. I started apologizing for using them, saying I didn't know they belonged to someone, but he said he left them there for me. Reggie started explaining how he was a struggling artist. He painted and painted, but nobody bought his art. He wanted to strike a deal with me. He said he'd buy me all the paint and other art supplies I needed, and that he could sell my art. He said he'd be the face of the business, since he was so charismatic, and I would get to paint whatever I wanted for money. We'd split the money 50-50. Now I realize it wasn't that good a deal, but back then I was homeless, desperate to get off the streets. So I shook his hand and made the deal with the devil. After three months, I was settled well into a small studio apartment Reggie found for me. Rent was pretty good and I had more than enough space. My apartment was full of canvases and sculptures and I was proud of each and every one. First thing Reggie did after we made the deal was drag me to a barber where he had them shave off my entire beard and cut my hair much shorter than it was. I barely recognized myself. I looked in the mirror for hours thinking, wow, I'm kinda good looking. Reggie and I became friends. He even asked me about how I became homeless in the first place. My parents died when I was pretty young, I told him. I didn't want to live in the orphanage I was put into, so I ran away. And I've lived on the streets ever since. Reggie was the first person to ever show any sort of interest in me. It was really touching. He put one hand on my shoulder and squeezed, trying to comfort me. It didn't work, but at least he tried. Now, I spent my days painting and sculpting or making pottery. Reggie spared no expense. Business wasn't that great though. For some reason, I really expected us to be making bank, but we were barely making minimum wage. Reggie walked in on the first of every month and handed me a wad of cash, but he looked more disappointed every month. I reassured him that I was fine and that things would get better soon, but he still left looking deflated. I would occasionally take walks around the city. I guess I was used to it. I visited my murals and I saw that there was a security guard at the first one I ever painted sometimes. I approached to see it and saw that it had a signature. Not just any signature, Reggie's signature. What the hell? He was meant to be selling my art, not posing as me. I stormed over to Reggie's apartment, which he said he'd be at, but when I knocked on the door, nobody answered. I waited for a long time and called Reggie several times, but nothing. He showed up after maybe two hours and looked shocked to see me. He was wearing really fancy clothes, so I asked him about that. They're knockoffs. Gotta look the part in order to sell, kid, he said. Before I could ask him about why he signed my mural, 
He waved a huge wad of cash in my face, more than we made in two months, and said, I sold one of your sculptures to some money bags. I grabbed the money, more money than I had ever held in my hands before, and thought things were finally starting to look up. Two months after that, I was still in the same apartment, painting until I didn't even know what to paint anymore. Sculpting until I thought my sculptures looked the same. I had spent a bunch of money on new clothes, so now my closet was full, but my stomach was empty. I waited by the window for Reggie to bring me my cut of the profits, and when he arrived, I noticed he slipped into the back of his car, moved around, and slipped back to the front, only then coming to give me my money. I watched him do this several times over the course of a few weeks. And then I realized what he was doing. He was changing his clothes. But why? The last time I watched him do that, I had invited him over to eat and watch a football game, but then went outside with the excuse of needing to buy something that I forgot. I sprinted downstairs into the parking lot and peeked inside Reggie's car. There were neatly folded clothes in there, and I could see the tag of a shirt. It was a very expensive shirt, and it didn't look like a knockoff at all. It was then that I realized Reggie must be scamming me. I bet he's selling the art for way more and giving me only a small percentage, I thought. I was furious. I wasn't about to be exploited by a slime ball like Reggie. I looked around to make sure nobody was watching and then I used a rock from the garden to smash Reggie's window open. I was gonna take the shirt, but I ended up taking a flyer that was next to it. It was a flyer to Reggie's gallery, apparently. More like my gallery. Reggie was furious when he saw his car window smashed open, but he had no way of knowing it was me, so he drove away. That night, I went on another walk around the city. I would have gone directly to Reggie's gallery, but the flyer didn't have an address, just a website that I couldn't access. It was night, and I enjoyed the wind blowing through my hair and lampposts illuminating my path. I again walked past loads of my murals, smiling nostalgically when I saw them. I also saw the spot where I slept my first year being homeless. I used to snuggle up with a teddy bear behind a dumpster, hidden where nobody could find me. A cop once found me and shone a flashlight on me, which woke me up and I ran away as fast as I could. Now, it was years later, and I kinda wanted to go back there. I walked for what felt like hours, part of me trying to find that damn gallery I was getting scammed with. I was giving up when I suddenly turned a corner and there it was. It was a glowing cube of glass, filled with rich looking people. I couldn't recognize it at first, but the closer I walked, the more I recognized the paintings and sculptures as mine. I stormed into the place, earning offended and disgusted looks from everyone around. They were, after all, dressed to the nines while I was wearing cargo shorts and a t-shirt. Where's the so-called artist? I demanded to know. From the back of the venue came Reggie, wearing sunglasses indoors in a well-lit room, like a pretentious prick. He held two glasses of champagne, one in each hand, and handed one to me. Relax, Kai. Celebrate. We're a hit, he had the nerve to say to me. You mean you are a hit, I said to him. All of these are my art, I exclaimed. Hmm, prove it, he smirked at me. I was speechless. He had won. He had two guards grab me by the arms and kick me out. Damn it, what do I do now, I thought. But then a light bulb lit over my head. I ran home, taking a shortcut. Now that I knew where the gallery was, it would take me no time to come back. Half an hour later, I was back with two canvases under one arm and a toolbox full of art supplies under the other. Reggie, I shouted. He came out of the crowd of people admiring my art and scowled. I'm ready, I said. The two guards set everything up for us. We had two canvases back to back so we couldn't see each other's. We had the same paint and the same amount of time to paint something as simple as a tree. I knew exactly how I wanted it, so I was more than confident. I could tell Reggie was pulling at his collar, panicking a little. He took off his jacket and rolled up his sleeves. One of the guards counted down and we started the race. I could tell I was doing well because people standing behind me were gasping, while people behind Reggie looked confused and some even betrayed. We spun our canvases around and revealed them to the crowd. My tree was a great representation of what my style was, a style which everyone in that room loved. Reggie's painting looked like a unicorn threw up on it. It was an absolute disaster. The two bodyguards grabbed Reggie by the arms as he kicked and screamed and threw him out through the front doors. He banged on the door, but they locked it. Everyone crowded around me, bombarding me with questions and saying they were going to sue Reggie to get their money back.
That was only the beginning. My paintings and sculptures all sold for more money than I could have ever dreamed of. I was filthy rich. Sometime later, I was living in a penthouse apartment, much bigger than I needed and with all the luxury. I allowed Reggie to live in the apartment I lived at before, paying his rent every month like he paid mine for some time, except I didn't change my clothes into less fancy ones. I let him see me in all my glory, dressed to the nines, every day that I threw some cash at him and then drove off to go to some celebrity's party.